Fourth of July weekend. You guys got plans for this week? You guys got stuff fun going on? I, I love Fourth of July. Uh, any holiday where we get to celebrate by blowing stuff up is an excitement to me. Uh, I've always loved fireworks. Not, I'm not a huge fan of going to see them. That's boring. But when I got the lighter in my hand, it's like, it's like my alter ego comes out. I get excited. Uh, I've always loved playing with fireworks. I played with, I've been playing with them my whole life. I've always gotten in trouble with them. I always accidentally burn stuff down. Um, actually, both myself and my son, I've had to call the fire department at one point each because of fires I've gotten out of control. Um, we, I would do stupid stuff. Uh, Roman candles on the back of four-wheelers, uh, shooting them at each other, or we'd take our rowboats out in the pond and We'd be throwing bottle rockets and fireworks at each other until one lands in the other person's boat and the other people would have to bail or else get blown up. Uh, even, even back in high school, um, even before Whitney and I were dating, uh, we would go out into the field and I'd buy those mortar fireworks, the ones that you drop down the tube like a cannon, they'd shoot up in the air. Well, I would go out there with myself and a couple of friends and my brother-in-law, well, soon, like future brother-in-law, and I, we would take, Whitney was set up by the house, and we would take those mortar tubes and we would tip them sideways. And Whitney would sit up by the house launching mortars at us as we ran through the yard. And it was a glorious time. Explosions all around, shrapnel hitting you, clothes burnt, hair burnt, skin burnt. It was so much fun. But I, I love it. I love... Uh, I love fireworks. I love uh, the 4th of July and the experience. Um, I love being in this nation. How many of you guys are glad that you live in um, uh, the American, like the United States of America, where we have our freedoms? Um, that's what we're celebrating this week, and that's just uh, an awesome opportunity. I think sometimes we take that freedom for granted. Um, uh, and today, I want to actually talk about that a little bit. I want to talk about uh, the title of my sermon today is One Nation Under God. And I figured it's a holiday weekend, uh, we're talking about, uh, we're celebrating our freedoms uh, as Americans, and I thought it'd be a good opportunity to just kind of share what's in my heart about what our role as Christians should be in our nation. Um, first thing I want to talk about is just the excitement and the joy that we live in um, of having these freedoms, these inalienable rights, um, that we have freedom of speech. Uh, I, I don't think we realize or, like, how significant that is, that I can go and just run my mouth on any platform I want, say whatever I want, and I do not have to worry about being arrested by that uh, because of what I said. It's huge. And even, I think, because we just, we grow up in it, we don't think anything of it, but even progressive countries like uh, England and Germany, last year, 3,000 people were arrested in uh, England alone because they violated speech law, because they said something that the government didn't like and they were arrested by it. So we t I think sometimes we just think that like globally, like everybody's pretty much, unless you're like a third world country and under a dictatorship, we pretty much have the freedom, but that's not the case. America, the United States, is a unique situation where we get to express and say whatever we want without fear of government reprisal. Now, I mean, it doesn't mean we're not responsible for the actions of, like, the consequences of what comes out of our mouth. That's a whole different subject. But as far as persecution from government, we're free from it. The second thing is freedom of religion. That here today, when we, we came together and we gathered as a, as a congregation to worship God and to, to hear his word, we had zero worry. There was zero anxiety. There was zero risks of us being persecuted walking in that door. And unfortunately, that's not a normal across the world. Um, I mean, if you go from like the Middle East, uh, the Christians being martyred there, or even the, the Christians in China that have to smuggle not even whole Bibles, but pieces, pages of the Bible. And if it's discovered, they, they have, there's, a, there's a legitimate fear that they can lose everything. They could be sent to concentration camps. Their families could be persecuted. We don't live in that. And I think that is an amazing thing. I think as a, a church, we should be so grateful that in all of, out of all of the times of history and all of the places that we can live in this world, that we live in a country that respects our right to worship God. And that's a huge thing. Um, I think it's an important thing. Um, 
So today, I want to just kind of mirror my, uh, my message today. We're going to be in the book of Jonah. Now, Jonah is a very popular story, especially amongst children. It's a very straightforward story. The entire book of Jonah, even though it's four chapters, I mean, even for me, it takes up three pages. And when I, bought, when I had my wife buy my Bible for me, I said, I need the Bible with like the largest print possible. So I got like a huge print Bible, like something that like I could wear without my glasses. I could, I could read it from over here. The font's so big. It only takes up three pages. It's a very short story. The four chapters covers one story, the story of Jonah. And we know it very well, but I just want to kind of dissect it a little bit and kind of view the, uh, compare the attitudes of Jonah to where we are today um, as Christians who live in, live in America. Um, the story of Jonah, um, at the beginning, I'm not going to read it word for word because we've all know this story. There will be parts, parts that I, I pop out, but the basic, the basis is this. Jonah is a prophet of God. He is a godly man that God has called to, where God has chosen to speak directly through him to people. I think it's a pretty significant thing. It's a pretty profound thing. Jonah was, at heart, a good and godly man. But at one point, God calls, calls Jonah and says, okay, it's time to rise up. I want you to go and minister to the people of Nineveh. And I want you to tell them that they have 40 days to repent. And if they do not repent in 40 days, I will destroy the city. And Jonah got excited about this. Not in the opportunity to go witness and to reach other people, but the people of Nineveh, this was a, a massive city, a fortified city, and this was a, a group of people that were at odds with the Hebrews. They were their enemies. They had conquered them at some points. They had taken them into captivity. So when, when God tells Jonah, hey, I want to destroy them, but I want you to go minister them, Jonah didn't like the first part of God's story, of God's command. I don't want to go save these people. I do not want to reach these people. I want them to receive what they deserve. These are an evil, wicked people. They have persecuted my my people, I want them wiped out. Thank you, God, for being just, a just God and, what, and taking care of them. So what does Jonah do? We know the story. He flees. Instead of going to Nineveh like he was told, he goes in the opposite direction. He jumps on a boat and heads to Tarshish uh, to just avoid God's commands. And in the process of that, um, we know the story the next, that the, the, in the, while he was on the boat, that the, the storm came. And at that point, he knew he had to make a decision. And I think as the, the American church, it is where we are right now, it is, it's a difficult season. We are going into an election year. And personally, as a, someone who is a pastor, the year leading up to an election is probably one of the most stressful and exhausting times. Why is that? Because we all have our own opinions. We all have our own beliefs on how we think the government should be run, and we love vocalizing those beliefs, and in turn, it causes division. The social media posts go rampant. People are giving out their, their beliefs of what should be happening, who should be our next leader, and all it does for the church is cause a headache. It, it, it causes us to get distracted um, in much the way that Jonah was distracted by what was going on. Because in his mind, he wasn't thinking about the souls. He wasn't thinking about the people who were lost in Nineveh that needed to be reconciled to God. He was thinking about those other people, that other group, and he wanted to see them get theirs, get what they deserve. In my... Uh, I believe the, the number one, the number one reason, the number one threat, I think we, I think at church, uh, in, in, in politics and especially in, in Christianity, we are always worried about persecution. We are always worried. Actually, the Bible says we will be a persecuted people, that we will be persecuted for our beliefs. And I think when uh, in America right now, we have it so easy let's be honest, we have it very easy and straightforward because of the freedoms that we are granted, that we do not have the real fear of persecution like other people in parts of the world or other people throughout history, other Christians have experienced. 
So we are in this essentially bubble of, I mean, of like paradise. We don't have to worry. We are so, um, we, we live in such comfort and we have, it's, it's so easy in our beliefs that the lack of persecution has actually gotten us distracted. Because now we go out and we cry persecution when it's just someone voicing a different opinion than us. We go out and say, this person clearly doesn't believe in God because they voiced a different political opinion than me. We have it so easy that we look for opportunities to create and find division. And the easiest way to do that is in politics. In our current culture, the division is so great. And honestly, I think that division is the greatest threat to our freedoms today. So I want to talk about what we can do to change. What can we do to turn the ship? What can we do to have a better outlook, especially over the next year, on how we view our lives, how we view our relationship with God, how we view the church, and how we view this nation. And in my personal opinion, I believe the answer is pretty straightforward. It seems simple, but it's probably the most significant thing we could do as as individuals and as a church. And that one thing is to take the gospel and make it the center of our lives again. I think growing up in a Christian Nation where the vast majority of the people are around us are either in a personal relationship with Jesus or they have culturally been raised in the church so that we all have a relatively similar way of thinking, of experiencing the world. Um, Sorry, I tried to write more stuff down than I normally do, and then it's getting me a little distracted, so I'm going to step away from my notes for a minute. But the gospel. In my, according to Scripture, uh, the gospel, this is a personal event. This is the most significant event in human history. Since the day that God breathed air into Adam's lungs until the day Jesus returns, The action of the gospel, Jesus sacrificing himself on the cross, was the single most transformative event that has ever taken place in the history of this world. But I think culturally, one of the problems we have is a lot of times our salvation now, we experience it at a very young age. We experience it, like for myself, I experienced salvation when I was when I was a child, I think I was like five, six years old. And because of that, we are so removed from that initial transformative process, that moment where we went from darkness to light, when we went from the the consequences of our sin to grace, that we have forgotten the importance of what happened on the cross and what happened in our lives when we accepted Jesus. I want to tell a quick story about my own salvation. Um, Honestly, and it kind of shames me to say this, this is actually my first time. I'm 36 years old. I have never given my testimony on stage before to anybody ever. Because in my mind, I was born and raised in the church. I was saved when I was five years old. What significant transformation can happen at at a five-year-old level in their acknowledgement and their, their trying to, their grasp and understanding of the gospel? But as a kid, I was a very fearful kid. Um, I I had a lot of fear in my life. I had a lot of anxiety. I didn't know what uh, anxiety attacks were, um, but I knew that I I experienced this form of my brain racing super fast while the rest of the world went around me in slow motion. And it wasn't something that I could stop. It just would happen at random. I remember being a very fearful kid. There were times when I decided I wouldn't want to go to bed or I wouldn't want to go to school. I was a runner. Um, I would, I had jumped out of moving vehicles before um, on my way to school because I decided I didn't want to um, go to school because I was too scared. I I remember driving down the driveway. We lived on three acres. It was a long drive. And on the way down, my aunt was taking me to school. I just unbuckled my seatbelt. I opened the door and I just did a tuck and roll. 
And uh, I remember running around the yard in a big circle, and my mom, she's here today, she, she was chasing me. And I was like a loose dog, like I wasn't going to be caught, like I wasn't going. It got so bad that uh, even going to school, there were times in kindergarten, um, I remember one time in particular where I actually sat down in school, they started the morning, and I decided, I can't be here. I got up out of my seat and ran out of the school. And uh, I had the principal, my teacher, and at the time, my aunt, who we carpool with, she was chasing, they were all chasing me around the parking lot in the school. Um, I went and locked myself in, the, in her van, and to this day, I'll still, I still like, I'm upset that I fell for such a trick. I didn't realize I was locked in there with the keys, but she like mimicked like she was opening the door and it freaked me out. So I jumped out the other side of the car and started climbing a light pole. Thankfully, I didn't have much open body strength. I only made it about three feet up before I realized I don't have the strength to climb a light pole, nor do I know how to. And they grabbed me and drug me back into school. But this behavior went on for several years to the point where my parents had to take me to psychiatrists and therapists trying to figure out what was going on with me and why uh, a seemingly, I mean, I wasn't like, I was pretty well behaved for the most part, but then when these, these, these moments would happen, I would just freak out. And my salvation, the day I accepted Jesus in my heart was so long ago that I only have very brief memories but I know based on my actions from kindergarten to my actions in first grade that it was sometime in that period because I was, I was changed. There was a, a children's event at church and being born and raised in the church, you went three days a week, any special events, you were there. Uh, there was a, a children's crusades type pastor that did a special service just for the children in the main auditorium, all these kids showed up. And I remember sitting there, and I remember hearing that call to salvation. And I couldn't tell you what the preachers looked like. I couldn't tell you what he said. I could tell you where I was sitting in the auditorium. And I can tell you that I walked up scared out of my mind that I was just, I'd never done anything like that before. And in that moment of a simple prayer, of saying, God, I, Jesus, I need you to be the Lord of my life. I am laying down myself. I am sacrificing myself. I am giving up my, my thoughts. Obviously, I'm five years old, so it wasn't even this complicated. Like, it was like, hey, Jesus, I think I need you. I'm scared. I don't want to be scared. And in that moment, there was a transformation in my life. It was a significant moment in my life. My life was forever changed since then. But the problem is, living in a nation that is predominantly Christian, we have actually taken the gospel and given it a backseat. It's kind of become a cultural milestone that we just expect everybody to reach at some point in their life. As parents, we pray for our children that they would be saved, and then it, like, once that salvation happens, we kind of check it off our list, we write the date in a Bible, and then we just pray the rest of our lives that they don't leave that salvation or they don't leave um, that relationship with God. But the reality is the Bible is very distinct and very uh, different in its process of, of how we should be um, reconciling our salvation. Uh, in uh, Philippians 2, it says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Our salvation is meant to be a thing that we do on a daily basis. That this is something that we should be working out from the moment we first accept Christ to the moment we go and see him again. That every day we should be working that out. What does that salvation mean to us? How is God using that salvation? I mean, think, this is the most significant thing that's ever happened to us. But it's something that we so very rarely speak about. As I'm telling you this story today, my children don't even know that story. It was just something in my mind that happened so, and I was, I was convicted about it this week because in my mind it's like, it just happened so long ago. It just wasn't a significant thing. My, my relationship has evolved with God so much since then that the origin story just kind of got lost. But if you think back to where God has brought you from, what he has brought you out of, 
And if you think about that on a daily basis, that is the, in the forefront of your mind, it will change the entire way you view this world. So the number one thing that we need to do is we need to get back to making the gospel the center of our lives. That needs to be the number one thing. If you are feeling anxious, if you are worried, if you do not have balance in your life, if you're not sure of the direction of your life, if you bring the gospel back into the middle and make that the main thing, I can guarantee you all, everything else in your life will start to fall into place because there is nothing, there's no more powerful force on this earth than the love that Christ expressed for, him, for us in that moment. Second thing we need to do, we need to learn to love others. And this is the difficult part. Um, one of the aspects of growing up in the church is I was not privy to interacting with unchurched people. I grew up in the church. I went to a Christian school. It was one of those things when uh, it was asked on a regular basis in church, who did you witness to? And I'd see all my friends like tell these amazing stories about how they were able to share their testimony. And they would get to me and I'd be like, I don't know any unsaved people. I don't know any unchurched people. And that's how my life actually progressed for a long time um, until I hit middle school. In middle school, uh, I had a very significant change in my life in that my parents actually purchased uh, an apartment complex for them to make a living off of in downtown Toledo on the corner of Souter and Manhattan. And I went from, I mean, I'm a self-proclaimed hillbilly, guys. I live out in a farm in Michigan. I live in the house that I grew up in, and I married my neighbor at 19. Like, I don't know how much more hillbilly you can get. I literally dress like this just for you guys. I wear, like, outfits like this, like, one day a week just to make the city folk feel comfortable. But, like, this is not, like, this is not, like, I am straight up, like, rural hick. That's how I live. That's how I like it. And I'm content with it. But I went from that lifestyle to all of a sudden in middle school, I now, because it's now a family business and I, they, I need to help there on the property, I am now being thrown smack dab into downtown Toledo. And there's a lot of people all of a sudden that I started experiencing and interacting with that I realized I had no idea how to relate to. Um, it was in a rough area and it had a rough group of people. Um, when my parents went in there, they viewed it as this is an opportunity to witness to all of these families. So they began opening up Bible studies and opportunities like Sunday schools for, chi for the kids and we started doing stuff on the property. But I quickly realized that I didn't know how to speak to these people. I didn't know how to relate to these people. And I can guarantee you I didn't know how to share the gospel to these people because I didn't know how to love them. So over the course of middle school and high school, I had to learn because I went from being a, a shelter kid who never interacted with anybody outside the church to all of a sudden we were bringing drug dealers and prostitutes with us to church. That we, we, we began building relationships. I remember I, I had to build this relationship with this gentleman. He was an entrepreneur apparently. He had two separate businesses. One, he was a drug dealer. And the second one, he was a pimp. And he got behind on rent one day. And it was my job. I did a lot of the groundskeeping. I mowed and stuff like that. And I showed up one day and my dad said, hey, this is this gentleman here. He is going to work off some of his rent today. So you need to work with him. And I'll tell you what, I mean, I hit like six foot at, in sixth grade, but I was like 165 pounds. Like I, I didn't have like, and this guy was, this was a man. This guy was huge. And my dad's like, hey, go, go work with him and go show him the ropes. And I'm like, you've got to be out of your mind. Like, there is no way. How the heck am I? He, he, my dad would come to me like, hey, he's not working hard enough. Go tell him to pick it up a little bit. I'm like, you go tell him. I am not doing that. I am scared out of my mind right now. Like, these, these were people that I did not have experience with. And to my parents' credit, they continued to push me in that direction. Uh, we began inviting people from this community into our homes. Um, it, it was not always the best group of people. We would have to sometimes like hide stuff in our house because we knew like there's a chance that some stuff might get stolen. 
But my parents put us out there. They put us out beyond the realms of my church and my school, which was 100% Christian people at all the time. And in that moment, I began to learn to love other people. And if you want to make a transformation in your life, and if you want to see the, this country transformed, that is the second step we have to make, is learning to love others. Psychologically, it is in our human nature that we, we love others the way we want to be loved. So we put the love out into the world that we want back, that what we need. And what happens is, by the process of doing that, we find other people that are also looking for that same type of love. So basically, we're reciprocating the same, same type of love back and forth. This is how family units are created. This is how cliques are created. This is how friends groups are created. It's because we are reciprocating the love that we look for in the world. But one of the hardest and most difficult things that you can attempt to do in your life is to learn to love other people the way they need to be loved. But the problem is that's a very difficult process. The problem is that requires us to open up a little bit. That requires us to get out of our comfort zone. That requires us to go out into the world where we're commanded to make disciples of all nations. And we have to learn about people who have different experiences and different backgrounds than us. And going into the next year, I can already tell you that it's going to get ramped up into pretty much two categories. You're going to have one side and you're going to have the other side. You're going to have a blue and a red. And we are going to judge people based on those colors for the next year. That we are going to disqualify people from our desire, to, to our, our commandment to spread the gospel because of that. And this is where we go back to, to Jonah. Jonah did not want this. Jonah says, these are not my people, they are other people, and I want them to be judged. And honestly, that's one of the, in my opinion, one of the core problems that we face in our own salvation, that we ourselves want to live under grace. We ourselves want to live under the forgiveness of Christ. But then we, in turn, want to see the rest of the world punished that we in turn want to see those who have wronged us live under the law. We have taken the gospel because of its, despite its power, we have subcontracted it out to the church in general. We have taken it from a very personal experience. If you look at the gospels in Jesus's uh, teachings and his time here on earth, whenever he was in large groups of people, he did what? He taught. He gave these lengthy sermons about what we should expect, how we should behave, what we should be doing. But when it was one-on-one, -on -one, if you look at, the, at Zacchaeus, if you look at the woman at the well, these were all people that he came to on a personal level and he shared the gospel. So my question is to you today, when was the last time you shared that gospel, that amazing transformative gift to someone that needed it? And then while you're thinking about that and realizing that, then think to yourself, when was the last time I shared an opinion on social media where I gave my thoughts, where I gave my concerns, where I gave my condemnation, where I took the opportunity to share my feelings to the world. And the sad truth of the matter, Christians here in America today, there is a dichotomy. There is a huge division between those Christians who are sharing their opinions and the Christians who are sharing the gospel. And I can tell you right now, if you want to see transformation in your, in your family's lives, in your friends' lives, in the coworkers that you've been trying to reach, make that change. Because what the world, as far as, I stopped giving my opinion a few years back, and I'm, not, I'm human, occasionally I'll see something that will infuriate me online and I'll spout something off. 
but it's few and far between anymore. I try to hold it back. But in, in lieu of that, in lieu of giving the opinion, if we were to give the gospel, if we were to learn how to love those people that we disagree with, that's where we find unity. There's unity in the gospel. One of the most, I think the most beautiful thing about uh, the, the youth just went to camp. We had eight kids that go, went down there And uh, I mean, Noah, Colin, and Jordan, they sacrificed a whole week of their life. And I I just, as a parent, I genuinely thank you guys. To see those children and even my own children come home with an excitement, not only for their relationship with God, but they networked with kids and youth in churches across Ohio seeing them Snapchat each other and add each other on different social media platforms, the idea of networking with each other. And the reason they're able to do that is because they all share one common thing, and that's the gospel. When I was in college, there was a joke amongst, amongst the theology majors where they would, uh, they would say, where two or more are gathered in his name, there's going to be a division in doctrine. Because there's always, we can always boil something down to a place where we don't agree. It's very easy to do. But the one thing that unifies not, every, not only every Christian in America, but every Christian that is suffering overseas, every Christian that is persecuted, every Christian is unified by one common thing. And that is, by our sinful nature, we were condemned to an eternity of suffering for our sins and our mistakes. But, that's the greatest but in the world right there. But because Jesus loved us so much that he sacrificed himself, he took the consequences of our actions. And in one action, not only removed our consequences from our lives, but ensured that we would have an eternity of peace and joy and love in his presence. Regardless of who you are, regardless of where you grew up, regardless of what you've experienced in your life, that is what brought you here today, is that one distinct thing. And if we could just get back to the gospel, if we can make that the center of our lives, there would be an explosion. There would be a revival amongst this nation. Growing up, we always prayed for revival. We prayed for these awesome movements of God where um, the Holy Spirit would just move in a region and we would just see lives transformed and and whole communities transformed. The number one way that happens is probably the most elemental and simplest thing, but it's the thing we do the least, and that is to go out into the world and preach the gospel to all the nations. Whether you agree with them or not, whether politically they align with you or not, whether their background is the same, their socioeconomical, their region of the world, whether they're an Ohio State fan or Michigan It doesn't matter. Because if we can remove all of the rest of the noise, if we can remove all of the extra, and we get back to the gospel, and I want to go back to to Jonah real quick right here, and we're going to go to, so Jonah is running. He jumps on a boat. He sits on the boat. The storm starts. All the, all the sailors are freaking out. They're like, what's going on? And then they go to, to Jonah and they say, who are you? And I love, what is, I love his response right here. Let me find it real quick. Jonah answered, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the seas and the land. And the sailors were terrified when they heard this, for he had already told them that he was running from the Lord. 
Oh, why did you do it? They groaned. And since the storm was getting worse all the time, they asked, what should we do to stop the storm? And at this point, it seems like Jonah's taken responsibility for his actions. He says, throw me into the sea and the storm will subside. And the soldiers go and, or the, the sailors go and do this. They throw him in the sea and the, immediately the storm stops. The next part, he gets swallowed by a whale. He spends three days in the belly of a whale. Why three days? If you continue to read down, I'm not going to read it right now, but if you read down, it says the sailors, after seeing the storm calm and after Jonah gave the testimony of who he believed in and who his God was, that they began worshiping the Lord. So then why did Jonah spend three days in a fish? Because the word of what happened began to spread. And then we know the story three days later, he has spit up onto the shores. And after spending three nights in a, with a fish, he goes to Nineveh. Why was he accepted in Nineveh? One, because God went before him. And two, the word of his testimony was spreading for those three days. Jonah walks in to Nineveh. And the people repent. He says, 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. The people of Nineveh believing God's message and from, the, and from the greatest to the least of these, they declared a fast and put on burlap to show their sorrow. When the king of Nineveh heard what Jonah was saying, he stepped down from his throne, took off his royal robes. He dressed himself in burlap and sat on a heap of ashes. Then the king declared a time of fasting for all the nation. You want to see this country transformed? You want to see God do something in this nation? It's not going to happen by electing a certain official. It's not going to happen by electing a new leader. that it goes back to the testimony of what the gospel has done in your life. Because from there, the doors begin to open. From there, the word begins to spread to the point where a king stepped down, the leader of a nation, not because of an army, not because of a vote, not because of being canceled, not because of fear of persecution, he stepped down because he heard the testimony of one man. If you want to change the world, it's simple. It starts with the gospel. It ends with the gospel. And everything in between it is the gospel. Corinthians tells us that if we could speak in tongues of men and angels, if you have the faith to move mountains and you don't know how to love, you're just noise. You missed it. And right now, I think the American church is filled with too much noise. And we need to go back to just loving others because God loves us so profoundly and so transformatively that we have no other choice but to express this news, to share the joy of what God has done in us. The Bible tells us that if we are to fall away or we are to get, if we are to get distracted and we come back, that we are to repeat our first fruits, that we are to repeat the first actions that brought us into that relationship. So I want to take a moment with every, every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're sitting here today and you're like, you know what? I was saved. 
I remember my salvation. I, I'm a Christian. I've been in this culture my from that time forward. But I feel like I've missed it. I feel like I've let the gospel take a backseat to my life. I'm going to keep it old school with every head bowed and every eye closed. If that is you and you want, I'm, just, I'm not going to call you up or embarrass you. I just want to be able to see you so I can pray for you. If you, have, if you feel that you need to go back to those first, those first actions to bring that gospel and that salvation back to the forefront of your mind, if that is you, just raise your hand. Okay, now I'm going to take it one step further. Maybe you're sitting here and you're saying, you know what, I've never experienced this. That I've been living my whole life and I've never, I have never accepted Christ. I've never experienced that transformative process. I have never experienced that love, that grace, and that forgiveness. I want to encourage you right now to take that opportunity. It's very simple. The action goes something like this. And again, it's a personal thing, so it's going to be different for everybody. But it's an acknowledgement that, God, I have messed up in my life. I have made mistakes. I have fallen short. But I believe because of your grace and your love and the sacrifice that you made on that cross, that if I make you the Lord of my life, that you are faithful and just and you forgive us of those wrongdoings. Please be the Lord of my life. Please lead me and guide me through this life that I may spread your word and your love and experience that eternity with you. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for everybody here today. God, it truly says something for a, a group of people that would show up on a holiday weekend when there is a million other opportunities out in this world to go have fun and enjoy life. But this group of people today, here and now have chosen to spend this time to worship and honor you. God, I pray for the, this church. I pray for Anchor that we would be known in this city as a group of people that are so in love with you that we have we are compelled that we, we have to spread that love throughout this, this city. God, I pray that Anchor today would become a city on a hill that people would be drawn to, that as these individuals go throughout their lives, that as they go into work, as they go into school, as they interact with their family and their friends, that you would give them opportunities that you would give them a chance to share the gospel, that you would give them the opportunity to share their testimony and what you have done in their lives. And God, just like Jonah, I pray that you would go before them, that you would prepare the people's hearts, that you would get the people ready for that moment, that they would have success. God, I pray that you would bring friendships and community because your word says that when we go out, we should go out two by two because when one gets knocked down, the other can pick them up. That the church would be a time, that Sunday mornings would be a time of joy expressing and sharing the stories of our week, of how God used us to transform people's lives, and how God used us to share his love. Your word says that the angels rejoice when just one person comes to know you. And God, I pray that we would forever mirror that excitement, that we would mirror that joy and that enthusiasm when the lost are found. God, I pray for our nation today. God, I pray that we would be able to overcome this, this division in our world, this division in our country that we would be able to reconcile and unify, not around a political leader, not around a political party, not around an opinion or an idea, but that we would be unified 
under you. That we would truly be one nation under God. God, help us realize that today and help us make that happen. God, I thank you and I praise you for your salvation. I am humbled by it. We praise you for who you are and we thank you for loving us. And in your name I pray.